All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, like Phil said, my name is David Bianco, or as I prefer to think of myself today, Doug Burks' warm-up band. <laughs> so I got my start in information security. I don't know. I'm not going to say how many years ago. But on the, on the, the network security monitoring side, that's actually how I know Doug, because um, I was an early user of some of the things that went into Security Onion. And, um, but in the last few years, I've been concentrating a lot more on the idea of taking big piles of data and doing some analysis on that data to try to figure out what kind of evil I can find out of that data. Threat hunting, um, data analytics, data science, it doesn't really matter what you call it. The, the kind that I do, they're pretty much all the same. So in this talk, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I approach these things and give you a kind of set of practical examples that you might be able to go back and take some of my code and do get started doing this kind of uh, thing with your data on your network. Specifically, I lied to you when I wrote this title. It's not only about Security Onion. Uh, I do have a couple touch points with Security Onion, but those are not the, it's not the only thing that you'll be able to analyze. Um, but before I get started on that, I feel like since Mark opened it up by telling you about his superpower way at the beginning of the day, I should tell you, I cannot fold a fitted sheet. And if you don't believe me, Go ask my wife. She will tell you. But I am an aficionado of dad jokes. There you go. So you're like, David, how do I know if it's a joke or a dad joke? And the only advice I can give you is it will be apparent. <laughs> so there's that. I have to front load all my jokes because the rest of this is a data analytics talk. So, <laughs> so what are we going to cover today? Uh, we're, I read all those words, five seconds, go. Um, seriously, uh, we're going to actually take a very brief, kind of high level intro, but I'm going to give you some really useful pointers to some different types of techniques that you can use for different kinds of data that you might have to extract the evil out of them. Uh, I'm going to, you don't have to know this really to get out of the talk, but uh, I'm gonna do all these things. First of all, in Python, you kind of do have to know that. In Pandas, you do have to know that. Um, but um, I'm using the Jupyter platform. I don't know if anybody Jupyter users in here. Yeah, a few. Um, you might have seen this in years past called the IPython notebook. Uh, but now I'll be using the Jupyter notebook for, for this talk. So first, I want to talk about probably the most important piece of data analysis software on the planet, maybe. Uh, it's this, this, certainly for people who use Python, as I do, it's this one called Pandas. Pandas is just a package that you can download. It's supported by the scientific, I think it's uh, new scientific Python. Uh, but it's one of the most popular pieces, probably the most popular piece, for people who deal with data in Python. Uh, it provides two data structures that are really important. I'm not going to go into super long detail. Most of these things that we'll, we'll find out uh, how they work kind of naturally through the course of the presentation. But I just did want to point out that we have this series up here, which is kind of like a fancy long array, except it also has a number of built-in functions that you can do to it. So you can summon a, a series in one go, or you can average it, or you can transform it by adding three to everything in the series in one statement, right? Things like that. And then more importantly for us, it has this, this idea of the data frame, which is a two-dimensional data structure usually, uh, we use it pretty, pretty much only as a 2D data structure, where it has um, columns which are named series. And each column, you can access the whole data frame as a row as well. So if the rows are, the, excuse me, the rows are all the same length. So if you ask for you know, column four, you get the fourth element across all the series. So it's kind of like, think of it almost like a programmable spreadsheet, but in a cool way. Uh, it's really extremely popular 
so much so that if you kind of Google anything, any kind of numerical question, and you add Python or pandas to the end of the, the query, you're very likely to get somebody who's asked your exact same thing in Stack Overflow. Uh, and so, you know, you, don't, you almost don't really have to know how to use pandas, you just have to kind of know how to Google for the answers with pandas. And that's kind of how I learned it. Uh, oh, um, I did want to mention one thing here. So, you can see on here an example of how we're going to create a simple one here. I'm just importing pandas. There's also this other one that we'll talk about a little bit as we go along called NumPy, which is a numerical library that pandas is built on. And we just create a data frame. In this case, I'm creating a data frame out of um, data that I just hard-coded right into my script. So a list of lists. And I call the columns A, B, C, D, and E. And then you have the, uh, and then you have the, uh, the data frame here, 0, 1, A, B, C, D, and E. So you can actually just call it you know, data frame dot A, and you'll get that whole series, or data frame dot zero, and you'll get that whole row. So hard coding everything into your Python script is usually not going to help you very much in uh, our kind of work. So how do you get that data in? Well, there's a number of ways. The, probably the most common way is to just read it in from a CSV file. So in the first example up here, uh, you can see I've just kind of named a CSV file, and it sucks it all in and returns a data frame that I'm calling df uh, because I'm great at naming things. But when you are talking about you're going to load up data from uh, Security Onion or Zeek, uh, you probably are talking about a tab-separated values file, not a comma-separated values file. It turns out it's super easy also. You just use the same read CSV, and you tell it that the separator is a tab instead of the default. And it just sucks everything all in. There's a lot of other options you can do if you, by default, it will look at the uh, first line to tell you the names of the columns in the data frame. If you don't have that, or if they're in a different place, or if you have some comments you have to skip over, or you know whatever. If, if your data file is compressed, uh, you can look all those up later. But it easily sorts them out um, with just a few command line options, and you suck it all into memory. Uh, the, this last one here, especially if you're working on something like um, Security Onion, where they might be logging in JSON format because they're sending everything into Elk, um, you can also read it as a set of JSON files. The only trick for that one is the default version of it thinks that it's going to be one big JSON document with a bunch of, as a, as a list of other JSON documents in it. So we have to tell it that uh, in our case, we're loading everything where each line is its own JSON document separate from all the others with uh, lines equals true here at the bottom or at the end. But either way, all three of those, you get a data frame reading it directly from a file. But what if you don't have it in a file? Well, you can query your Elastic or Splunk servers directly now and return the values to you as a programmer as a pandas data frame. This is a library that I wrote that um, I wrote for my employer, Target Corporation, right? Yay, retail. Uh, <laughs> why are you laughing? I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is a library I wrote called Huntlib, which is basically I packaged up a number of smaller uh, functions and, and classes from Python that I use when I do my hunting. And uh, Target has allowed me to open source that and release it on GitHub. And you can see the uh, link here on the slide. As a side note, uh, even though Target as a corporation has been using that for a while to release a bunch of open source like data engineering and, and API programming and development tools, um, recently the team that I work for in the Cyber Fusion Center, the security team, has started releasing more and more uh, open source packages as well. So I encourage you to go around to github.com slash target and just look around. There are starting to be more things that are security analysts uh, and security infrastructure engineers that we might really care about. Um, I want to call out my, my coworker, uh, Josh Liberti, has published probably the biggest package uh, from our team 
that will be published in probably a while, uh, called Strelka, which is kind of like a, our, our take on uh, Like a Boss. So uh, Huntlib, to get back to the uh, real reason that you came, uh, Huntlib has a bunch of different functions, and it can do things like tell me how far apart these strings are, like what their edit distance is, or how similar they are. I can tell you, like, entropy. I'm now seriously thinking about putting um, uh, bigram frequency after listening to Mark's talk. Um, maybe I should put that in there. Uh, but what we care about for today is it has this elastic DF. So if you take three lines similar to these, like from Huntlib without elastic, import elastic DF, right? And then you give it the, you construct the elastic DF with just the URL to your elastic server. And you can just do a search. Search, and then you can give it the, the, the same Lucene query that you would type into Kibana or something like that. Uh, and tell it what index you want to search that from. And it will re do that search and re return to you a pandas data frame. Now, if you're on Security Onion, you, it will look probably a little bit different than what I have on the slide, because by default, Security Onion does not allow you to contact the Elastic server from off of the Security Onion box itself. It's restricted to localhost. So probably the best way is to set up an SSH tunnel, and then instead of naming the URL explicitly here, you would just say, like, uh, localhost, HTTP colon slash slash localhost, right? Um, but then you get connected, and you don't have to actually export your stuff and transfer it to your box and import it as a CSV file or whatever. You can just get it directly from Elastic. Uh, the Splunk version of that is extremely similar to this, but we're just not showing it because it's an open source talk. So once you've read on your data, what do you get? Um, well, this is, uh, this is an example of me reading this transactions by bytes.csv file. And you get this data frame, df. You call it df.info, and it'll tell you a little bit about the metadata behind that data frame. And you can see, first of all, well, there's a whole bunch of things in here, but first of all, look, the, we have almost 37 million entries. I'm sorry, Mark, I can't really say megalogs without. <laughs> But, uh, so we have, I'll try, we have 37 megalogs. All right. Uh, <laughs> and they're, by default, just indexed by integer from zero to whatever that is. Uh, and we have six different columns. We have timestamp, destination, dest IP, et cetera. Uh, and then the last thing to note is it's taking up 1.6 gigabytes of memory, which is not terrible on my laptop, but certainly could be a lot better. There's a number of things, though, uh, that I don't like about that out output. So I've read in that data, but am I ready, really ready to analyze it? And for most times you read that data in for the first time, the answer is no. You're going to have to do something about that uh, to kind of clean it up, normalize it, reduce the memory footprint, et cetera. But I also want to see kind of, first of all, if I'm parsing everything correctly, so I'm going to call the df.head method, which just prints out the first few lines, just to give me that idea. Did I parse it out? Yeah, it probably looks like I did. That's a timestamp. That's an IP destination, a dest port. Uh, it's a floating point, but OK. And same with bytes. It looks a little bit weird. Uh, protocol scheme and HTTP method. Not everything in here was a HTTP transaction. There are outgoing transactions of many sorts. But those two things only apply to HTTP transactions. So uh, if I parse the rest of them correctly, I'd probably parse those correctly as well. And Pandas is just showing me that uh, its version of null is NAN, not a number. Uh, so it's just showing me that it didn't have any entries for those in those rows. So it looks like I parsed it correctly. So now we can begin to kind of clean that data up a little bit and see what's going on. The first thing I would normally suggest is Drop any columns that you don't need. Just delete them, get rid of them. In my data frame, I wanted to keep them all for this exercise. So here I've just created again that example from the beginning where I created some out of a list of lists called A, B, C, D, and E for the, the column names. And here's an example of just how you drop some, right? I'm just going to call df.drop, and I'm going to make a list of the names of the columns, and I'm going to drop column B and column E. 
Uh, it's a, only a slightly bit tricky in two ways. First of all, you have to tell it what axis you want to drop, because I could have had these rows called A, B, C, D, and E too, and it wouldn't know if I want to drop rows or columns, so I have to tell it the axis. So in pandas, if I'm dropping axis one, that means I'm dropping columns, and if I'm dropping axis zero, it just means I'm dropping rows. The other tricky part is, you see I have this df equals df dot drop. By default, all of these things return uh, views of the original. So it creates a new view of that data frame and returns it. And so I could actually have kept the original data frame and create a sub data frame out of it. In this case, I don't want to do that. I explicitly want to get rid of the old data frame because I'm trying to reduce my memory footprint, not increase it. Uh, so I just assign it to its, the output of itself. And this is the, a very, very common pattern you will see me use like almost every thing that I do in this presentation. And you will see a lot of other people uh, code doing it too. So uh, the next thing is I want to maybe drop some unnecessary rows. Remember I said not everything in here is a HTTP transaction. If I'm only interested in HTTP transactions, I will drop everything that's not one. Right? Makes sense, right? In this case, I'm more interested in things that actually completed than things that tried to not complete, or tried but did not complete. Uh, so for example, the way I tell if it was a completed transaction is if I transfer it any bytes. For, uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm looking for things like data exfiltration or whatever, and I can't really do that very well without transferring bytes. So first of all, anything where the number of bytes transferred was zero, I want to drop. But in ours, we don't actually show zero, it shows null. That's just the way our data was. So we're going to do this thing up here, and we're going to unpack this. First of all, remember, we have the data frame, and then the column name is bytes, so I can name it here, df.bytes, and now I'm looking at a series, right? And then is null. So really what I'm doing there is applying the is null function to the entire series, and it will return a series of the same length where every value is either true or false depending on whether it was null or not null in that. But I don't want to, I don't want to keep the one is where they're null. I want to keep the ones where they're not null. So there's a not here. This little squiggly thing is a not. So I'm just inverting the truth values in that whole series. So I end up with a series that's the same length as the bytes series, and it says if there's bytes in it, it's true, and if there's null, it's zero, or it's false. And I'm using the handy dandy data frame subscript method, which accepts a number of things. One of the things it accepts is a series of true false. And it returns only the subset of those where the, the value was true. Think about that for a minute. That part is, uh, that took me a little while to fully unpack. But basically it says, anytime it is null, I'm going to put that into my resulting data frame, and if it's, and if it's uh, excuse me, if it's not null, I'm going to put it in my resulting data frame, and if it is null, I'm going to leave it out, and then I just apply it to myself again, and so now I've just dropped uh, all these rows. In fact, you can see I call info again, and I dropped like half the rows, and I'm down to uh, just a tad over one gigabyte, actually a tad under one gigabyte, right? Uh, so that's pretty good. I dropped like 0.6 of a gigabyte already. But we could do a little bit better. If you see here, the data types for much, much, most of these columns are, are kind of odd. Object, object, float, object, object. When you see object data type in pandas, it means, eh, I don't know what that was. I'm just going to basically store it as a string. Not a great thing to store everything as, because if, for example, you think of the number uh, 1,000, you could store that in like two bytes, or you could store it in four, five bytes as a string with a null terminator. You would like to store it as a number in two bytes, I suspect. So the other next thing we can do is actually come back and correct the data types really simply. The data frame has this as type function, and you can say it's a, the argument is a dict where it has the uh, names of the columns and the data type that, they, that you want them to be. So here we're saying timestamp is a date time object. I don't 
for some reason my thing is not even going now. That's awesome. Uh, where my, uh, my, my timestamp is a date time object from NumPy, so it's 64 bit date time. Uh, I have, I'm setting the, the bytes to be an integer column. Makes sense, right? Uh, and then for some of these other ones like Desport and Protocol Scheme, I have this thing called category. Category is a little bit weird one. If you think of a column of values, if you really do have a, lots and lots of different values and there's not very much overlap, uh, you probably don't want this. But in this case, think of like the HTTP method. You know, that's your get and your post, right? And there's just not that many values that you can have. Out of 37 megalogs, you, you might have less than 10 distinct values, right? So why store 37 mega strings worth of data <laughs> when you could store the category probably as a, as a number, a byte maybe, and, and just have that many of that byte, right? Instead of that many of that strings, which could be two, three, four times as much. So here we're just gonna convert them into categories. And if, you, if we'd done that, you can see that now, uh, I keep thinking this is gonna work, uh, but now you have the date time, there's a timestamp, that's correct, and we have some categories, and we have an integer type, and that's, we're down to like 645 megabytes. So that's pretty good. Notice I did keep the destination as an object because that could be an IP address or it could be a domain name or something, and it really is more like a string in this, what I wanna do. Uh, also, I would like to tell, tell you for a minute, you might be saying, David, you screwed up because we have dest ports and they're clearly integers. Who thinks a dest port is an integer? Oh, nobody. You're smart. You're not falling for that trap. Yeah, dest ports look like integers, but you don't like multiply two dest ports and get a new dest port, or you don't subtract four from it or divide it by nine. They're really not, they're, they're more categorical data. So we treat them as categorical usually. I don't know why this thing has stopped working. But we'll see if we can maybe do without it. So now that we have this data and we've read it in and we are now prepared to do analysis with this data, right? The first kind of analysis that we might wanna do is probably one that a lot of you in this room have done frequency analysis, sometimes called stack counting, which I firmly believe is probably like the number one numeric method of threat hunting, just hands down. This is what everybody learns first, almost. So all we're doing is basically we're saying, in this case, I would like to see how many different HTTP method verbs we have in our data and how many times each one appears. And I'm interested in the less frequent ones because I expect a lot of like get and post, maybe some head or option or whatever. But I wanna see what's in there and the more rare they are, the more interesting they might be to me. So I'm gonna order them that way. So really, this is pretty simple. Uh, Pandas allows you to do this on a data frame by using this group by function up here where it says df.groupby, and you can group by just the name of one column, or you can even have a list of column names so you can do a multi-column grouping. But the group, the group by return value is not that useful by itself. You have to tell it what you want to do with that group. So I'm doing some function chaining here, so I'm grouping by the HTTP method row or column, uh, but then I'm telling it to apply a count, the total amount of times that occurs, right? And then I'm just doing this weird thing called reset index, which just makes it look a little bit nicer, but technically you don't need to do this. Um, the result here I'm gonna sort, and you're like, why is he sorting it by the timestamp? I don't even see any timestamps on here. So this is a little bit unusual. So what happens is when you say a group by for one or more columns, there's probably other columns that are not in that group, right? They're, they're not part of the grouping. What it does when you do count, it actually returns the, the count of non-null values. Like we've already filtered out the, the, most of the nulls here, so that's not as much of an issue for us, but it, that's what it does. And 
if you have columns uh, that have data in some of the rows and not in others, and maybe they're different amounts of those uh, nulls in different columns, you could actually get different numbers across the board here. In our case, though, our data is really rather um, uniform in that way. So we get the same, I think it's the same number in all, all of those across e each row. So you just have to choose which one of those that you want to sort by. Uh, just as a good practice, I know that every single thing in there would be guaranteed to have a timestamp, or it's kind of like they say on the internet, timestamps or didn't happen. Oh, nobody? All right. <laughs> but uh, so, so I chose timestamp. But really, in this data set, I could have chose any of those like, other ones, and it would have given me the same answer, right? So I've come to say, OK, I've got, you know, what is it, a little over 1 million gets, uh, a bunch of posts, some, even some heads and options. But that, those puts, man, I only got seven out of 37 million entries. And I kind of, maybe I've just been conditioned this way, but I kind of find put value or put objects to be weird and kind of suspicious because they're main, their really only use is to put a data blob on the, main, on the remote server. And we used to see them a lot when, like, I don't know, in like 1999, when you had to publish your website from your desktop publishing application and they would use puts. I don't, I don't see them a lot really now. Um, but uh, let's see what we want to, to, we want to find a little bit more about those. So let's see what we can do about that. Well, fortunately, Pandas makes it really easy to drill down. We're going to use a similar mechanism that we used to drop some of those rows. We're going to just say, look, I want all the rows where the method is put and return that. One thing to note, I did not say df equals anything, because I don't want to overwrite my whole data frame and so that I drop everything but seven rows. Um, Jupyter's platform is really smart about the, the return value of a block of code. It just automatically prints, when, no matter what it is. And so the return value of this is just the, the temporary data frame that was returned from that selection. So I just get a data frame of, what, seven rows? And um, totally nothing on here to be concerned with, I think. That last one is looking pretty suspicious, I gotta say. And here you have, you, you have the timestamps. I didn't put the um, source IPs on here because I didn't want to do a bad job of anonymizing them, but you could have done that, and it, you would know the IP that it came from and the time, but now you just know the time and you know the destination, so you can find it yourself in the raw logs or something in query elk. So that's how you find something, uh, one way of finding anyway, a specific transaction that's bad. But what if you're more interested in finding like a group of transactions that collectively are suspicious? Well, we often work with data over time. I've seen it in some of the other presentations today. We have a timeline of things, and you're like, find me the spike. Well, the problem is, when you're looking at a bunch of data that happens over time, you don't necessarily want to find the spikes. You want to find the unusual spikes. Because if you think about it, things have a kind of a rhythm that they go in pretty often. If you look at, for example, the total number of outgoing transactions in your network, they probably spike around 8 or 9 o'clock when people come into work. They go down a little bit. They probably spike again at around noon. And they probably drop off a lot at like, I don't know, 5.30 or 6 when people leave. Those are, you know, those are spikes, positive spikes or negative spikes maybe, but they're spikes. But they're not necessarily unusual spikes. So what we want to do is we want to focus on how you can find the spikes that normally wouldn't happen that might be indicative of something odd going on. I don't know if it's malicious or not, but it's suspicious. And to do that, we talk about using some techniques that co fall under the collective term of time series analysis. Sounds hard. Basic idea, super easy. 
The first thing we're going to do, though, is we have to construct a time series. So a time series is just a regular series in pandas, really. But instead of having integer indexes, it's going to have a date time index. You can pretty much have any kind of data type you want as an index to your series, as long as each one is unique. So we'll have a date time. And we could easily convert the, the, the data frame we've been working with to a, a data frame that has, a, sorry, a series that has a, an index of the date times of all the events, but we don't necessarily want to deal with every single event. When we're doing time series analysis, 37 million data points is probably a lot for individual transactions. So the first thing we usually do is think of how we can bucket those so that we don't have 37 million data points, we have a far smaller number that are representative of that 37 million. So in pandas, we call this resampling. So I have created an, a, a data frame that just says the, it's called the XFIL DF, and it just says the, the index is the data frame, um, sorry, the index is the timestamp, uh, and the value is the bytes. I just had to pick some column, you know, here's the value. And now I want to resample that into, I just picked 15 minute buckets. Because it seemed like that was a pretty good deal. We want to look at daily patterns. So we pick something that's substantially smaller than a day, but is still reasonable. So you might, if you have more data, look at things like weekly patterns or monthly patterns. But uh, I didn't have that much data. I only had one, one month or so of data. So I had enough to do daily patterns. So I bucket it here, say, I'm going to create this uh, XFIL data frame. I'm going to, this new time series is the XFIL data frame, the timestamp and the bytes from there. And I'm going to set the index to be the timestamp. And now I have a data frame where the index is timestamps and the values are bytes. But now I don't, but now they're the raw transactions, individual transactions. So I want to say, I'm going to resample that to 15 units of time minutes. I don't, I, I'm not sure why they used T for that, except probably you could resample things to months and then it would be two M's and it would be confusing. So 15 T means 15 minute time buckets. And the aggregation that I want to apply is just the total number of transactions that happened. I'm not actually using the byte value in this. It was just a convenient way of creating the individual transactions. I'm counting the number of transactions that happened in each 15 minutes. And then the last one, drop in a, I'm just getting rid of any times, any buckets that didn't have any transactions in them, like maybe overnight or something, just to make this small. And then you can see I'm looking at the, the, the top of it. And indeed, I have timestamps that are exactly 15 minutes. So each of those stamps is the beginning of its bucket. And then I have values. So it's easy. So now it should be super easy to find the unusual uh, spikes, right? Guesses? <laughs> no, this is still super noisy. There's like this downward thing. So things at the beginning of the month apparently had a higher transaction volume than the bottom of the month. So you can't really do an apples to apples comparison across all the days of the month. Uh, there's a lot, there's a substantial amount of noise in there. And it, so it's hard to tell which of those spikes are expected, which are not, which are even really spikes and which are just noise. It's hard to see. If you stare at it for a really long time, you might be able to gain a little bit of insight, but you know, I can't really tell that much about it. So in terms of time series analysis, the things that we're interested in are three things. We want to take this raw data, and we think of the raw data being composed of three different parts, and we're going to decompose the, raw, the observed data back into those three different parts. The first part is the, uh, well, the first one on here you, you see, I've, I've called seasonal decompose. That's really all I had to do is call seasonal decompose on my time series. I told it which model I wanted, but I think that's technically optional. Um, and I told it the frequency. So I computed the number of minutes in a day, but because we have 15 minute buckets, I divided it by 15 
and that means the number of buckets I have in a day, and that's, I've told it, the patterns should be this wide. So I have 30-ish of those in my data set. And it goes, and it returns me uh, a value, uh, a structure that has four things in it. The first thing is just the observed things. It's a copy of exactly what I passed in, right? The second one here is the trend line. I really wish this worked now. Uh, oh, it does. I really wish I had a million dollars. No. I blew my wish, man. And the, the, and the second thing is this trend line. And the trend line is, uh, is important because later on, if you see the original one, it's kind of like tilted like this, but using the trend line, we're going to make it more straight. Basically, things which are exactly on the trend line are going to come out at the zero line. Things that are a little bit above or a little bit below will come out a little bit above or below zero, but they'll be straight, so it'll be easy. The third thing here is the, the seasonality, the seasonal pattern that we saw per day. It's, it's hard to see that uh, all jumbled up, but I think you can probably see that it looks like a really repeating pattern, even though you can't really tell on that small view what the repeating pattern actually is. And the, the third, or the fourth thing here, is what we call the residual. It's the observed values corrected for the trend and corrected for the seasonal pattern. Don't worry, you don't have to read it off these tiny things. This basically is just something that you, pr you print to show yourself that it actually worked. So, here's a plot in a little bit better detail of one day of that repeating pattern, right? It's still pretty noisy, but it doesn't matter because this is your normal pattern, and you don't really have to know what all those spikes and dips and things actually really are or for. They, are just, they just occur on a regular basis throughout the, throughout the um, data set on each day. And yeah, there's some spikes that occur. Uh, these actually go through like, uh, I think it's like 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. or something like that. Um, this spike and this spike are the exact same one, so that's actually where the, you know, 24 hours. So it's fairly noisy, but the, the cool thing is that now you've identified it. You don't really have to know it, what this all means. So here I'm just plotting the residual data. This is the corrected data, and you, it's super nice. You can say, hey, at the beginning of the month, at the end of the month, the trend lines have been corrected. I've taken out the seasonal, uh, or the daily, I should say, the, the seasonality, the daily fluctuations. And, and now it just becomes a matter of I pick what I want my threshold to be, and I draw a line straight across the graph. And any spike that it intersects with well, that's my, that threshold is my unusual threshold, so anything it intersects with, I'm considering unusual. And if I say it's around 500 or 600, you know, I'm going to get one, two, this is actually two really close together, so four, five, maybe. Five unusual spikes out of the whole thing. That doesn't mean they're all bad. It just means they're unusual, they're pretty large, they wouldn't normally be explained by uh, the normal daily activity. Right? And there may be other tests that you could apply to this to kind of narrow those down, but that's the basics of the, the time series analysis, correcting for the trend and the seasonality so that you can actually more easily find which ones are the unusual spikes that you might care about versus which ones are the spikes that you'd normally expect. And this is pretty much the end of my presentation. Uh, everything that I've used is on here. So we have uh, Python, of course, and the Project Jupyter, uh, the Jupyter Notebook or the Jupyter Lab, uh, a really great web-based interactive Python environment that you can bring in these. Uh, the, it merges the Python code, the plots, the text, any other images or media that you have, and puts it all together in one document so you can keep track of what you did, why you did it, and you can do it again easily later. Uh, also, NumPy and Pandas, you can download from there. Um, I didn't really talk a lot about this, 
This is kind of the express version of this uh, talk that was a little bit longer. I dropped a few slides to make it fit in the time, but the visualizations that I did were created with a third-party visualization package called Plotly and a package that binds them to the pandas data frames and series uh, called Cufflinks. So if you actually want to reproduce the graphs, you would use Plotly and Cufflinks. And then Huntlib, I talked about earlier, that's the thing that I wrote that, that Target open sourced. And stats models for the um, seasonal decomposition. Now, that's a lot of tools, right? And you could get them and install them, no problem. Um, but there might be an easier way. The, the last thing here, uh, the threat hunting project, of which I'm the principal and probably uh, realistically the only person. Uh, <laughs> I should just say I. I created a Docker image with all these things in it. And that Docker image is actually what I use day to day when I'm doing my data analysis. So the tools that I'm using, exact copies of that tools are all available to anyone who just wants to do a Docker pull. Uh, and you can find that uh, here at this URL. There's a, um, a little bit about that and pointers to it on both the Docker hub and the build environment for it if you want to build your own copy on GitHub. Um, that's pretty much it. I will just uh, say that the copies of my slides I've already posted. I meant to say that at the beginning of the talk, probably a bit more helpful. Uh, but if you, want to, if you want the link for them, uh, they're on my Twitter account here, David, at David J. Bianco. And with that, is anybody still awake for questions? No, the answer is no. All right, well, I'll be here. Uh, and I'll be at uh, B-Sides tomorrow for a little while. So if you have any questions, let, hit me up. Otherwise, thank you very much.